To start off with, I'm a country boy, so some of these words, especially names, I'm going to do the best I can. <laughs> this is God's word, Amen. Ezra 3, 1 through 6. When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josadak, with his fellow priest, and Zubarobel, of the son of Jetiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of God of Israel to, the, to offer burnt offerings on it. And as is, as is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the feast of booths, as is written, or as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule, as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon, and at all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of every one who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is, It's All About Worship. It's all about worship. When you boil down everything about heaven and earth, it's really all about worship. I'm grateful to be part of a church that is missional, but that's only the means for us to get to our main goal, which is the worship of God. Last week we saw that, that the, the remnant return from ca captivity from Babylon to Judah. And we saw list after list after list of families and individuals. Chapter 2, in short, shows us the importance of individuals here at Crosswalk. We want you to know that each of you are important. You're an important part of our gospel ministry. And we need each and every single one of you to, to do your part so that we can grow for the glory of God. In order to accomplish what God called the remnant to do, they gave freely to the treasury to rebuild the house of God. We see this in chapter 2, verse 68. Crosswalk, thank you that you give freely of your finances and of your time in serving and in your time of praying corporately in support of our gospel mission here at church. If chapter 2 shows us the importance of individuals, then chapter 3 shows us the importance of corporate unity. We'll see that the remnant gathered together as one man to restore the worship of God. We'll also see in our text this morning that as they sought to build the altar, that they ran into an obstacle. What about you, church, this morning? Do you need to restore your worship of God? Perhaps you're here because... You can check the box. You went to church this morning. But do you need to restore your worship of God in prayer? Do you need to restore your worship of God in your service of him? Do you need to restore your worship of God in your Bible reading? Why should you restore your worship of God? Because it is in your worship of him where he meets you. 
It's in your worship of him that he will hear your prayers and rise to provide for your needs. It is in your worship of God and in your time of devotions that he will lead you and guide you and protect you. It is in your worship of him where you can find rest. It is in your time of worship with him where you can find peace. And hope for the future. Why should you restore your worship of God? Because our God is good. Because his steadfast love endures forever. We'll see this next week. Today we'll see in Ezra chapter 3 that worship was a priority. We'll see that the the building of the altar was important because it was where God promised to manifest his presence with his people. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We find ourselves in the Old Testament, written in a foreign language some in Hebrew, some in Aramaic, both of which I'm not an expert and have very little understanding of the original language. But your power is without limit. So we trust in your Holy Spirit that you would use this feeble man and this feeble sermon to speak to us that for those of us who are discouraged this morning perhaps for some of us our worship of you need to be restored you would use your word to encourage us to motivate us that you would stir our hearts to get up or to stay up later and spend time with you in your word and in prayer talking with you confessing to you, and even crying out to you. Complaining is appropriate because you're a God who can take our pain and our sorrows. And you are a God who is able to turn them into joy. So we ask that you would grant us the gift of illumination by the power of your Holy Spirit. Open your word to us. And speak to us the meaning of your word so that we may understand it rightly and rightly apply it into our lives so that transformation will happen so that we can become more like Christ and bring you glory and honor. We devote this time to you now. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Recently, I was reading a book and this book had a section on mountain climbers. For safety reasons, mountain climbers rope themselves together when climbing a mountain. That way, if one climber should slip and fall, he would not fall to his death. He would be held by the others until he can regain footing. The church ought to be like that. When one member slips and falls, the other should hold him or her up until he or she regains his footing. This is the benefit of having unity in the church. Similarly, as we build this church together, we need unity. Or we need to gather as one man, as Ezra put it so that we can worship God and that his worship can continue in this place. We need unity. We need to gather as one man as we build the the church of God. Why? Because we will and have encountered obstacles and spiritual oppositions. And when these oppositions and obstacles come, we can persevere. This is the importance 
of unity in the church. This is the importance of gathering together as one man. Here's the main burden of the text as I studied it. Despite all the obstacles and oppositions, as one man in unity, we are to build up the church of God for the purpose of worship. If, if I could summarize all that I'm about to say in the next 35 minutes or so, it would be that despite obstacles. As one man, we are to build up the church of God for the purpose of worship. This morning, I have two main headings for us. If, if you're taking notes, here's the first main heading, the building of the altar for worship. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 2. And so just a quick of a bit of a review from last week, we saw that in chapter 2, Ezra tells us that the remnant lived in their own towns. Now in chapter 3, it tells us that when the seventh month came, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Now before we dive into the sermon further, we need to ask the question, so when was the seventh month? Did this gathering together as one man in Jerusalem happen after the seventh month of their return? Bible scholars differ on the chronology of this, but it is best understood that the seventh month refers to the Hebrew month of Tishri. And I'll speak more about this month later. Now, if, if, if you were a part of that remnant, if your name was listed in one of the family names and as individuals, you would have traveled from Babylon to Judah and it would have taken about four months long. Now, we need to remember that this took place in around 538, 537 BC. So wipe your memories of all that we know and let's go back there. They traveled on foot in some challenging terrain and it took them, scholars say, around four months. Yes, that's very appropriate. I was just trying to think. I just came back from Colombia. I flew out of Colombia with our team, uh, Bogota, Colombia, to Orlando, Florida. We flew on an airplane. So we went to the airport at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't get home until 8 o'clock in the evening. All the while, just riding in an airplane, riding in a car. Can you imagine being one of the remnants, traveling on foot, having to carry supplies with babies on, on hand, on challenging terrain for four months? If, if we study the chronology here, it was only after a few weeks after their arrival, that they gathered in Jerusalem as one man. They, they gathered in Jerusalem after a few weeks. Can you imagine? Like, if, if I was one of the, the, the remnants, I would have tried to secure a safe house or a shelter at least. I would have tried to at least establish my living quarters. But after several weeks, they gathered together as one man in Jerusalem. What can we learn from the remnant? Here's what we can learn from the remnant. This was a people on mission. 
God had stirred the spirit of Cyprus or Cyrus. God had stirred the spirit of the remnant and they were on mission to build him a house in Jerusalem. They gathered together as one man. Let me put it in our vernacular. They gathered together in unity. As I was studying this week for this sermon, it forced me to ask the question, does Crosswalk gather together as one man? Do we gather together this morning in unity? How would you answer that question? I think I would answer that for the most part we do. But can we grow? Is there room for unity? Is there room for growth in our unity? The answer is absolutely. I love that our community outreaches are well attended in, in my perspective. But do we have more room for more gathering of the church to reach our community? The answer is absolutely. I love how, how our prayer services every Sunday morning from 9.15 to 9.45 is well attended for the size of this church. Do we have more room to gather together in unity as one man? The answer is absolutely. Listen, church, if, if we are ever going to reach our community with the gospel, if we're ever going to grow as a church, then we need to be, pray, we need to be a praying church. We need to be on our faces before God, praising him for what he has done for us. We need to be praising him for his faithfulness and his love and mercy. But we also need to be praying to God for him to add more people to this church. Why? So that we can fulfill our part of the mission to reach our community with the gospel. We need to be a church praying for younger families to come and build with us. And I'm so grateful for all the younger families with children who are here. Church, can I ask you? Can you be praying for God to build up this church with more young families, with, with more children? Why is that important? Why is that a personal burden in my heart? Because one day you and I are going to die. And who are we going to transfer the gospel to? Who are we going to entrust the, the good news of Jesus Christ to? We must raise up the next generation. We must transfer the gospel faithfully. And so would you join me and the elders in praying for God to add younger families to our church. It is not for Crosswalk's namesake. I trust you know my heart. It is for his glory and for the good of our community. The question each of us needs to answer is, am I gathering with my church as one man? Am I gathering with this body of believers in unity or do I have differences that I need to reconcile with God and perhaps with people in the church. Maybe it's a ministry position that you're after, but you do not have. Maybe you, you don't like how some of the, the pastor elder team make decisions in the church. If that is you, then I want to encourage you, come and attend Crosswalk in, in, in unity as one man. Because if it is God's will that you have a ministry position at Crosswalk, then wouldn't his will be done? 
This is God's church. And if he sees fit that change needs to be made, wouldn't he be the one to be the agent of change? As a pastor elder team, our desire is to follow the leading of the Lord. And it is our conviction that we lead the church as servant leaders and we want to cultivate our humility so that we can respond when God acts in our church for change. In order to be a healthier church, we need to gather as one man. We need to gather in unity. The remnant was on mission. And so they gathered as one man corporately. Are we on mission? Individually, are you on mission? I submit to all of us that we are all on mission. The question is, what mission are you on? Are you on mission for just yourselves or are you on mission for God? What was the remnant's mission? Their mission was to, re to, to restore the worship of God. Just like the days before the exile. You see, while they were in exile, they were not able to worship God like they did before. They were on mission. They gathered together in Jerusalem as one man in unity because they knew they needed to restore the worship of God. Today, we need to be on mission so that, so that we can restore the worship of God to people who are worshiping idols, the idols of this world. You might be wondering, well, what are they worshiping? Let me answer that with a date on the calendar for February 11th, which is a Sunday. Can anybody guess what's taking place February 11th? The Super Bowl. Now, there's no doubt there will be faithful Christ followers who will be watching that. There will be faithful Christ followers who will be playing in the game. Just as a side note, I, I'm rooting for the 49ers because Brock Purdy, <laughs> Brock Purdy is a Christ follower and he uses his platform to bring glory and honor to the Lord. My true team is, is really any of the Florida teams, but they're not in the game. I digress. But for the majority of the attenders, they're going to be there as one man in unity, cheering on their favorite team or their favorite players. They're cheering on their idols. It's worship. That's exactly right. They're worshiping their favorite team or their favorite player. Wouldn't it be God? glorifying if all of our churches were filled with people that go and fill up the football stands. God is calling all the earth to worship him. But how are the unbelievers going to worship him if they don't believe? And how are they going to believe unless they hear the gospel? And how are they going to hear the gospel unless we are sent to preach the gospel? This is why our local and global mission are very important. This is why as a church, we need to gather as one man in unity to support our mission for the lost. Thank you for all of you who support our missionaries and mission organizations. Verse 2 says that with the leadership of Jeshua and Zerubbabel, the people built the altar of God to restore worship. 
They, they built the altar of God so that they can offer burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. Did you notice that it took two teams? Jeshua with his fellow priests and Zerubbabel with his fellow kinsmen. What can we make of verse 2? Here's the message of verse 2. Verse 2 tells us that it takes team ministry to restore the worship of God. Let me put it in our literary context. In, in chapter 2, it shows us that individuals are very, very important. But in chapter 3, corporate unity is very, very important. Crosswalk, if we're going to build up this church, which is the church of God, which is the house of God, it is going to need, it's going to take all of us, it's going to take every single one of you to build this up for the glory of God, for the namesake of our Lord and Savior who saved us and died for us. Therefore, as a church, we need to be gathering us one man in unity in the worship of prayer. As a church, we, we need to, to gather together as one man in unity in our worship of song. We need to, 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 to gather together as one man in unity to read through his word and to, to, to be in unity in our worship, in our giving, in our serving. We need to gather together as one man to be able to reach our community with the gospel. You're needed. You're important. God has gifted you with talents, has provided for you with resources. But please don't use that only for yourselves. Use it for the glory of God and for the good of his church. First, the remnant gathered together as one man to build the altar of God. Next, we'll see that they offered burnt offerings at the altar. Now, the remnant may have built the altar of God, but it was without, it wasn't without uh, an obstacle. Verse 3 tells us that they set the altar in its place for fear because of the peoples of the lands. Bible scholars differ on who, on who were on who were these people. Were they were they the people of the lands that were surrounding Judah, or were they the the people who were left there after most of the people were exiled to Babylon, who later intermarried with foreigners that were brought in by the Assyrians and the Babylonians? Regardless of who they were, this fear had some substance to it. We know this because in, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 4, the people of the land discouraged them from building. And later on in this sermon series, the remnant will all together stop building. Do you see the parallel here between us today and the people of Israel? We too have and are and will encounter obstacles as we seek to build this church. The question is, are you going to persevere through the oppositions? the obstacles. Before we came to crosswalk and committed to the revitalization of this church, I knew personally that 
we were going to encounter obstacles and opposition to the revitalization of this church. I knew that there would be spiritual opposition that will seek to make me and us fearful to do the work of the Lord. But one thing I know, church, the Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 4, that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Do you believe that? Amen. 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 Listen, let me, let me drill down more on a personal level. Do you feel opposed? Do you feel or have obstacles in your worship of God? Perhaps you've, you have legitimate reasons why You've stopped worshiping him in the reading of his word, or perhaps you stopped worshiping him in prayer. Maybe you just lost your job, or maybe you just got a bad doctor's report. Maybe your, your family is falling apart, or your marriage is in trouble. If you're in that season, then I don't want to minimize the pain and the heartache that you're going through. But I want to encourage you to put those pains, those heartaches and struggles to the worship of prayer in God. Oh, but, but I am praying about it. Well, can I encourage you? Continue to pray. Continue to worship God in your prayer until he does something. George Mueller is considered by most as a man of prayer and faith. He did many great works for the kingdom of God, but he is most remembered by his orphanages. In his lifetime, it says that he took in over 10,000 orphans who would have otherwise lived in workhouses in miserable conditions or they would have been living in the streets can you imagine the obstacles the challenges and the oppositions of caring for more than 10,000 orphans we have a few children here at crosswalk and we do offer children's ministry. We're struggling to have workers in our children's ministry. And by the way, if you serve in children's ministry, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for serving our children in our children's ministry. If you have children who, who, who are in children's ministry, please thank the teachers who give of their personal time preparing for lessons so that they may show Jesus to them. Donald Whitney said, yet George Mueller never made the needs of his ministries known to anyone except to God in prayer. Get this, I try to keep a prayer journal so I can relate. George Mueller, in his journal of prayers, recorded over 50,000 answered prayers. Over 30,000 prayers that were answered were answered the same day or right at that moment. Listen, church, prayer works because our God is able. Amen. This is why we need to continue in our worship of God in prayer. This is why we need to gather as one man in our prayer services. 
Because when we go to him corporately, because when we go to him individually, he is faithful and able to meet our needs. Church, do you believe that? If you don't, I dare you, try it. Even though fear was an obstacle, the remnant placed the altar in its place. Why did they continue to build that altar and put it in its rightful place? Because it is where God promised that he will make his presence with his people. We see this in, in Exodus 29 verse 4 and ex also in chapter 30 verse 6. It was at the altar where God promised that he will be with his people. Well, today, we don't have a tabernacle. We don't have the temple. We have the church. And it is where God makes his presence manifest through his Holy Spirit. After all, the church is the household of God, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. It is filled with image bearers like you and me. This is why when we gather, we ought to gather as one man in unity when we pray, when we worship God in our prayer. Because it is where he promised to be with us when we are seeking to be with him. It was at the altar that the burnt offerings to the Lord resumed. Verse 4 tells us that they kept the feast of booths as it was written and offered burnt offerings by number according to the rule, according to the law of Moses. The, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles was commemorated during the Hebrew month of Tishri. For us today, one commentary said that would be like during our September, October month. And it is said that this Hebrew month of Tishri is the most sacred of all the Hebrew calendar, the liturgical calendar. The first day of the month is the celebration of the new year, which is called Hashanah. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Katie, <laughs> I don't know. Um, then it is followed by the Feast of Trumpets, which is Yom Teruah. Teruah. Then the Day of Atonement, Yom, Yom Kippur. And then a celebration of the Feast of Booths, which is a week long. Now, as we dive deeper into God's word, what's so significant about the, the Feast of Booths? Here's the significant church. The offering of burnt offerings was a bloody affair. Hundreds of bulls and rams and male lambs were killed and their blood was poured out at the base of the altar. I'm trying to read through the Bible in a year myself, and, and the, 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 the Bible reading plan that I selected is, is the chronological um, Bible reading plan. And, and last week, I was in the middle of Exodus, and I was reading about Aaron and his sons who are being consecrated to be the priest. And in their consecration, they, they slaughtered the bull. They, they, they rubbed the, the blood of the bull on the horns of the altar, and then they poured out the, the blood of the bulls against the, the, the base of the altar. The whole consecration was a bloody mess. I, I don't know how else to, to paint that picture so that we can go from 77 North Carpenter Road, Titusville, Florida, to the, the, the ark where they made these offerings. It was a bloody mess. Why all the shedding of blood, you might be wondering. Here's why. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Leviticus 17 verse 1 and Hebrews 9 verse 22. 
Why did they need the forgiveness of sins? Because it was their sin of rebellion that led them to their destruction and their exile. However, the, the shedding of, of the blood of bulls and goats only covered their sin temporarily. That's why they, they continued to offer burnt offerings on a regular basis, it says, according to Ezra chapter 3. You see, all of these repeated burnt offerings pointed to the coming Messiah. Hebrews 10 verse 4 says that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Jesus, the Savior of the world, came, humbled himself, and was led to the cross where he shed his blood so that you and I can be forgiven of our sins. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 says, In him we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice. This is why you and I don't have to come to this building bearing bulls and, and goats and having to sacrifice them by shedding of their blood. Jesus' blood paid it all, church. Perhaps you are not a Christ follower, but... You're here, or maybe you're listening online and you're struggling with sin. Sin is dominating your life and it's causing chaos in your marriage or perhaps it's causing trouble in your parenting and your relationship with your children. And you're feeling this, this overwhelming weight of guilt and sin and shame. If that is you, then I want to encourage you to surrender your life to Jesus. Put your faith and trust in him. Make him the Lord of your life. And when you do, you will feel that weight of sin, guilt, and shame being lifted up off of you. When you do, you will be given a new heart, a new spirit as we prayed this morning. And you will be given divine enablement to be able to persevere through all the struggles and sufferings of your life. Why did they, they celebrate the Feast of Booths? Because it was a time to remember how God delivered the people of Israel from the slavery in, of, in, in Egypt and how he brought them into the land, the promised land, their own land. It, it commemorated a time when Israel was wandering in the wilderness. It was a time during which they were wholly dependent on God to provide for their needs. They were wholly dependent on God to guide them through the wilderness. Someone prayed this morning, I think it was part of the text, that God led his people by a pillar of cloud by day and by a pillar of fire by night. They were in desperate need of God's provision, protection, and guidance. And so for, for the remnant, for them to, to celebrate the, the festival, of, festival of booths, it, it would have meant for them to, to construct flimsy shelters. Instead of living in, in the comforts of, of their home, they, they lived in the discomfort of the flimsy shelters for a week to remind them of their need for God to provide for them. For us today, we're still wondering in our own wilderness. Our true home is not here. It's in the true promised land in heaven with God. 
for us today, we too have been delivered from slavery, but not from the slavery of Egypt, but from the slavery of sin. We have been delivered from the slavery of Satan. That should have gotten an amen. I don't think we're an amen church, are we? Now, I'm not suggesting that for us today, we should spend a week in in a flimsy tent. But let's use the struggles of life. Let's use the the pain and the sufferings of life to remind us that we are still in wholly dependent on God for our provision and our protection. Let's not forget, this is not our home. Let's not forget that as we continue to to wander in this wilderness, that the trials of life are meant to, to draw us to Jesus, to God who can relieve us of our suffering and pain, who can provide for our needs, who can give us guidance. I thank God that his word is a, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The question is, are we worshiping God in his word? While we continue to fail in sin, let's repent and let's trust the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. And when Satan tempts us to despair because of of the guilt of sin within, let's look to the Son of God who came to be the propitiation for our sins. He is the one who came to appease the the, the wrath of God that was meant for us because of our sins. 1 John 4, 10. Let's praise God. Because he redeemed us from the slavery of sin. And he has filled us with his Holy Spirit. So that we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, mortify the desires of our strength. Thereby mortifying sin. We do it by his power. Therefore, he receives all glory, praise, and honor. In conclusion, worship team, will you please join me? While this earth is our temporary home and while we want to to gather together as a church, we ought to do so as one man. We ought to gather as, as, as a church in unity to build up this body of believers so that worship can continue and so that for those who are weary pilgrims who are not yet here can come and know that their struggles... Their sufferings are meant to point them to the one who can relieve them of pain and sorrow, who is the source of hope and assurance and peace for the future. Would you stand with me, church?